Earlier this year, TD Asset Management announced that its affiliate Epic Investment Partners would take over the management of its main U.S. blue chip equity fund. Well, that change has happened on November 1st, and with the name changing to TD U.S. Capital Reinvestment Fund, and the two people now heading the fund are David Sino, Managing Director and Portfolio Manager and Senior Analyst, and Stephen Bleberg, Managing Director and Portfolio Manager, both at TD Epic, and they're joining us from New York. Gentlemen, it is lovely to have you both with us, and I'm looking forward to the conversation to find out a little more. Stephen, if, if I could, I'd like to start with you. Um, this isn't the first time that I've spoken with somebody at uh, TD Epic, uh, so I do know the importance of cash flow, and, that, and, and that's something that has always been very important. But maybe you could just tell us, remind us why you have that, that um, emphasis on cash flow over earnings. Sure, Kim, and, uh, and thanks for having us. Um, I think the best way to, to start is to tell you a story about my first day in business school, which was many, many years ago at this point. But uh, I remember the first day of my introductory finance class in business school, the professor went up to the board and he wrote two words on the board. And they were, the two words were time and uncertainty. And he said, finance is the study of how we value uncertain cash flows over time. And I, I think that's still the best definition of finance I've heard in all in, in all these years. Now, accounting is something quite different, and accounting is, is what produces things like you know an earnings per share number. But accountants have a kind of a different view of the world than that finance view of the world, as we would call it. So, for example, if if I run a company and I go out and I build a factory, and I spend ten million dollars to build that factory, uh, the accountant will say to me. Uh, well, how long is that factory going to last? And if I say 10 years, the accountant will say, okay, great. So we will charge a million dollars a year for 10 years uh, against your revenues because accounting has this thing called the matching principle where they're trying to match up revenues and expenses over time, which is fine. It serves a certain purpose. But if you're trying to value the business and understand whether this company is doing well or not, it matters. The timing of the cash flow matters. It's not going to be a million dollars a year going out the door for 10 years. That $10 million went out out the door today to build the factory. And so the timing of cash flows matters. That's why you should focus on the, the how a business generates cash flow and also what they do with it. So our philosophy is basically, you know, sort of twofold. Number one is it's the ability of a business to generate not accounting earnings, but free cash flow that makes it worth something to begin with. And then equally importantly, it's what management does with that free cash flow that drives the value of the business up or down. Meaning if they're gonna, they can either broadly speaking, either reinvest the, the cash flow into the business or give it back to the shareholders. If they're gonna reinvest in the business, they should really only be doing that if they can earn a return on that investment that's greater than the cost of that capital. And when they run out of opportunities like that, the best use of the cash flow at that point is give it back to the shareholders because they always have other things they can do with the money. We're just bringing up the, the chart now we have here about the, the founding principles of TD Epic. As I mentioned, the free cash flows you talked about and you were just talking about the ways that that cash flow are, uh, can be deployed, whether it's reinvested in the business or paid out uh, to shareholders. So much of this, I know, though, is, uh, you know, when I've spoken with you and your colleagues in the past, too, is about, you know, finding the cash flow is often um, uh, very related to the quality uh, of the companies that, were, that you look at. And quality, I know, is something that uh, I believe that you think is important, but is often, quote, mispriced. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. Sure. Well, well quality in the investment business has traditionally uh, meant three particular statistics. I mean, there are things like quality indices and the way the companies that provide those indices determine who goes in is they look for three particular statistical characteristics. One is uh, high return on equity. Second is low leverage because, you know, you, one way you can boost your return on equity is if you just go out, borrow some money, buy back some stock. The business hasn't changed, but now there's less equity. So a given level of profit will mean a higher return on equity. So the way you kind of prevent that from happening is in terms of defining quality is you say, yes, high ROE, but with a low leverage. And then the last thing that's usually used is um, uh, earnings growth stability or stability of earnings. And our view is those are all nice things to have. And the, the companies that, that David and I look at in the fund that we're managing tend to have those characteristics. But to us, that's, that's not enough. Uh, we think quality means more than just those statistical definitions. It, it has to do with two more things. One is what we were just talking about, that how does management allocate capital? Do they understand the principles of, of sensible capital allocation, only reinvest when they can earn good returns on capital, otherwise return the money to shareholders? And the second one, and I think more important, is uh, we're looking for businesses that have what we would call you know, a sustainable competitive advantage. Sometimes people call it a moat. 
Uh, you want a business that is not just earning high returns on capital today, which to us is sort of the best measure of quality and, and profitability, but uh, it's companies that have, do have some unique attributes to their business that are going to enable them to continue to earn high returns on capital going forward, you know, regardless of sort of what happens in markets. Sometimes you see companies in I like energy or commodities type companies where when, when you know the price of the underlying commodity goes up, their returns look good for a while, uh, but they are not really in control of that. They're kind of at the, at the mercy of the markets for setting the price of those commodities. And when the price inevitably comes down at some point in the future, their returns immediately deteriorate. So to us, that you know, quality means that you have something that makes you unique, gives you pricing power so that you can control your margins, control your returns on capital. I wouldn't mind just maybe if we could get into a little more detail about um, what you know, you are looking at specifically when you're looking at what companies uh, that you want to put into the portfolio. So Steve, I'll start with you again. What is the process or, or metrics you use when you are generating ideas? Sure. Uh, so, you know, we do think of ourselves as, you know, fundamental managers, uh, but even you know, no matter how fundamental you say you are, you have to have some way to narrow the universe down. There's thousands and thousands of stocks out there. You want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're exercising your judgment most effectively, narrow the universe down to some set of companies that you can do a deep dive on uh, and uh, be most effective in finding uh, good performers. So we have a couple of tools that we use to get the process started. Basically, one is a screen where you pass or you fail, and the other one is, is a sort of a ranking model. So there's a number of criteria we screen stocks for, given what I was saying a moment ago, not surprising that number one is, you know, return on invested capital. We're looking for a premium over their cost of capital of at least 5%. We have a couple of growth metrics, which are not particularly heroic. Basically, what they boil down to is we're looking for companies that can grow at least as fast as the economy or better. We're not demanding, you know, 10, 15, 20% growth. Just as long as you can keep up with the economy or do better, that's fine. And then we look for very high profit margins as well, because that's uh, sort of a, a good way to <laughs> screen out companies that are growing, but just sort of for growth's sake, and they're hurting their margins in the process of doing so. So that that gets the universe down about, that screens out about 90% of the names in the universe. <laughs> then we apply uh, a proprietary ranking uh, system we came up with, looks at a, a whole bunch, almost two dozen different variables, most of them based on free cash flow metrics, basically looking for companies that are, as we've said, generating free cash flow, allocating it sensibly, uh, ranks the stocks relative to their global industry peers. And that, that helps us narrow the universe down even further. So that starting from, you know, a, a U.S. universe of, you know, three or four or 5,000 names, that gets us down to maybe 100 to 150 names, of which obviously we already own some of them, but uh, it gives us a, a smaller pool to work with to start doing a, a deep fundamental dive on those that, that David can tell you more about. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get to David then. So uh, David, you, you've gotten the universe narrowed from again, thousands to hundreds. Uh, and then it's your choice uh, uh, to think about, you know, how do you go from being interested to actually adding it to portfolio? What do you look at? Sure. Uh, good evening, Kim, and, and thanks again for hang, having us on the program. Uh, so at a, a very high level, uh, we ask ourselves two questions when we are considering a name. Those are, how did we get here and where are we going? How did we get here being, why does a company earn high returns on capital today? What are the advantages that it enjoys? Um, does it have a high margin business, as most of our businesses do, or is it a, a business that is a very efficient user of capital, or ideally both? Um, so in the how did we get here category, if it is a high margin business, we ask ourselves, well, does this company enjoy a price advantage relative to its peers and why? Uh, and does it enjoy or does it enjoy a cost advantage relative to its peers and why? Um, that, that's the first part. That, that's fairly uh, fundamental uh, finance 101, if you will. The harder question to ans answer is, um, where are we going? That is, how sustainable is the is the current level of profitability as measured by returns on capital? Um, how sustainable is that into the future and for how long? Um, that is also a two-part question. Uh, the first thing we ask ourselves is, what is truly unique about this business? Does it have a technological advantage? Um, does it have, uh, by definition, difficult to replicate physical assets? Does it have a very skilled management team? Um, does it have brand equity? Um, those are some of the things that make a business unique. Um, it, that's good to be unique. Lots of businesses are unique. Uh, you may be able to see over my shoulder here the Empire State Building uh, out of one of these windows. 
that is a unique, unique property, but uh, it is a fixed structure. It is not a growth property. A company cannot, the owners of that business cannot reinvest and make that building any taller. And this is the capital reinvestment strategy. So we need to identify opportunities that a business has either organically or inorganically to reinvest in their business and compound the, the terminal value of that business over time. We are mindful of risks, be they technological obsolescence, uh, regulatory risk, risk of consumer taste changing, uh, risk of new entrants entering uh, the company's line of business. Uh, all of those things we need to be mindful of. Um, bad behavior by management <laughs> is a big risk as measured by how they allocate capital. And to that end, we, we pay very close attention to how a management team is compensated. What are the KPIs that reward them? Uh, are they growth related, which are, are good, but are, are, is, is that growth that creates value? Uh, is management incentivized to not just grow, but, but grow in a way that they, they, earn a co they earn a return on their capital greater than their cost of capital? It's so uh, oh, go we ahead, are mindful sorry. of, sorry, go ahead, Kim. No, you go. Okay. So uh, the last piece of the puzzle is we, we will not buy such a business at any price. Uh, we do take into consideration um, the percentage of a, of a company's cash flow that it is reinvesting uh, and at what rate of return we can expect to earn on, on, on that reinvestment. Um, but we're willing to pay fair value uh, for a great business as opposed to uh, paying a great price for a fair business, the, the old Charlie Munger axiom. Um, so this is not a quality at any price strategy by any means, but uh, we are willing to pay a fair value with the belief that businesses that do earn a premium to their cost of capital will, will compound shareholder wealth over time. You know, it's it's uh, when when you say it like that, it sounds I won't say simple. It sounds clear, and I'm sure it's so hard to do when you're actually trying to get out there and see all these things. Um, I should let people know who are watching. We're going to give some examples of what that looks like in terms of some portfolio stocks that you own, and and maybe some of the ideas as to why. Before I do get to that, though, um, and you mentioned a couple of these, I thought was just as interesting as you know why that you're attracted to certain companies and bring them in, but probably the same conversation why they stay in. Uh, we have a chart here um, that that you know, and, and you mentioned something about management bad behavior. I'm sure that's something that is uh, keen on your radar to understand, you know, do they want to stay there? But again, we're just looking at some of the reasons we have for selling a stock. So just even even though it's gotten there, you're not, uh, you're clear as to what it takes to remain there. Yeah, so we, we do sell stocks. <laughs> We've spoken a lot about uh, why we buy stocks, why, why we might sell them. Uh, you, you just mentioned one of them. Um, I'd say one of the most frequent reasons we sell is because management makes misuses shareholders' money, uh, misallocates capital, uh, as most evident, is most evident in uh, M&A, uh, which not all M&A is bad. Uh, most of it is. And uh, if, if we hear a management team say, well, this deal is going to be accretive to earnings in year two, well, that's great. Well, but are you earning your cost of capital in year two or year three? Uh, it's not so much a concern of ours if, a, if an acquisition is is accretive to the bottom line, that, that's almost meaningless to us. We want to hear that management is at least thinking of its cost of capital when it is make, uh, making acquisitions. Um, and if they make, sometimes they make fairly large acquisitions that in our view, uh, we don't understand either the financial or the industrial logic of the transaction. Yep. Uh, so that is cause for us to sell. Um, so another reason is, is simply that the world changes. Um, Owning a, a business in 2017 that has a visible patent cliff in 2023, well, we say, well, we have six years in front of us that, that are fairly visible. Uh, as you get closer to 2023, you're asking ourselves, is, is, is this still sustainable within our investment time horizon? And, and if, say, a pharmaceutical company um, cannot fill that, that patent hole that, that, that's, that is coming and is very visible in an economic way, um, that is another reason for us to sell. 